Yeah, my name's Wei, and I'll be giving the talk for the next um, hour, hour or so, a couple of hours. The talk is called the 2012 and the Fractal Brain Theory. And it's all about uh, the brain, mind, and consciousness. Now, now this um, thing you see uh, as, as you're waiting for the talk to begin, that's actually my brain. Um, Sian a few years ago. Now, now, a few years back, life was really cheap, and I would do anything for a couple of bucks. And one of the things I would do is have my brain scan for 30 pounds, 40 pounds. You kind of go into a scan and listen to some Mozart and some goth music, and you rate it depressing or sad, and they scan your brain. You press a little mouse in a little mirror. And for, if you're more adventurous, you can get more money from doing, say, three double blind trials, and they stick a catheter in your arm, and they put drugs into your brain. So one trial I did was to uh, test memory drug for schizophrenics. So I had to give you a drug to make you schizophrenic, and then another drug to double blind study to boost your memory. And uh, so that, that's hundreds of pounds. And for thousands of pounds, you could um, do studies where you stayed for several days, and they took a spinal tap, and um, you had to sign a waiver clause in the contract. So make about five, three, three, four thousand pounds in a week. Um, but if they waived the right to sue, uh, the, 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 you could be paralyzed and waist down, kind of chance in the thousand, and uh, you waive your right to sue. And, and the experiment could also turn into, into Elephant Man. So, but yeah, but um, I, no, I never did that. I had a friend who did, did that, did, did, these, um, uh, did these experiments, and he's dead now. Um, of other causes, not of that, but I mean, he, he, was, he was reckless. I mean, so, but the upshot is uh, I had got these brain scans. And um, I, I tell you, the, the feeling I got when I received the attachment of this, my own brain through the email, and I, and I looked at it, I mean, really, after you know, spending so, so much time in my life, decades, thinking about the brain, the, the, literally the hairs on the back of my neck, ding, kind of, you know, there's your brain, that's my brain. Amazing, surreal experience. Anyway, um, so we're going to explain the brain. The brain is probably the most complex object in the universe. Um, tens of billions of neurons, uh, tens of trillions of synapses, 100,000 kilometers of wiring in, in your, in, just in your skull. Incredibly complex objects. But there's a way of looking at the brain which makes it seem far more understandable. In fact, behind all that complexity is an amazing simplicity. And that simplicity is because the brain is fractal. So I'm going to explain what fractal means and then show how the brain is a, is a fractal computing architecture. So, okay, preliminaries. Uh, fractal means, if you can all see that diagram, fractal means um, that something is self-similar. Now, there's a, con a concept of symmetry, which you'll learn in, in O-level, it shows my age, kind of GCSE mathematics. We, if you take, take that shape there, which is, is shaped like a brain. Now, if I translate it over there, it's, it's basically translation symmetry. It's basically the same shape that's been moved over there. So, okay, I've moved it over there. Now, that's rotation symmetry. So, it's the same shape that's been rotated. And here we have reflection symmetry, and you can combine the, the transformations. So you can you can translate, but then I've translated it. I've also scaled it. Then I've translated it, scaled it, and rotated it. Now, if I take the same shape, if I make smaller copies of itself and I put it inside itself, okay, like we have here, now that look, looks a bit more complex. But you see, it's basically the same shape, but I've made smaller copies of itself and I put it inside itself. So it's self-similar. The copies inside itself look like the whole. Now, if I do that again and again, that's called recursivity. I'm recursively doing the same process again, again and again and again. I can take that process to infinity. And that, 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 this property of self-similarity, nesting and recursivity, is, is called fractal. So that fractal object is basically self-similar. The parts look like the whole. Just to reinforce the point, um, say uh, the classical nested Russian dolls, this is, say, um, fractally nested Russian dolls. So, so a kind of like a um, slight, slight adaptation. If I take that doll there, I kind of zoom it out, and, uh, and then I take that doll there and I zoom it out. I can do it with all the dolls. I can do it to, to, do it to infinity. So this idea, basically, that these nested, nested dolls, are, are nested Russian dolls, are fractal. And just to, to reinforce the point some more, here are some mathematical fractals. So it's, it's a, a three-sided um, triangle made fractal. There's a, there's a dodecahedron made fractal. So you can see that the small parts reflect the whole. And uh, there's, there's another fractal called a uh, um, Romanesque broccoli or Romanesque cauliflower. See, the, the, the small parts reflect the whole fractal objects. Now, um, so, so we're going to show that the brain is fractal. So behind the complexity is actually this stunning simplicity. Now, um, I'll talk about the brain. We can't really avoid going into uh, brain science. So we're going to do like a, a survey of cutting edge brain science in, in, in quite a short space to give you a complete overview of the entire brain now. 
and then we're going to reduce th this overview to this complete fractal conception. So, okay, overview of the entire brain. That's, that's what we kind of normally get in textbooks. Um, the, 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 there's your brain, there's a sideways view. Now, if you kind of split it down the middle, that's another view where you're kind of looking from the kind of split down the middle from the inside out. And um, you, can see, you can see it's a very crinkly surface. It's, like a, it's called cortex. It means bark. And it looks all raggedy and jaggedy and kind of crinkly. Now, in fact, that crinkly surface is actually a flat sheet. If you scrape out all the white matter, scrape out all the wiring, the, the, the brain is actually a flat sheet. Now, if you, it's drawn to scale. So if you imagine that's the side of your head. If that's, that's your head, you have this huge kind of huge handkerchief, paper napkin, kind of compressed into your brain. But it's actually flat, maybe slightly concave. So you've got this huge kind of like uh, kind of surface folded into your brain, hence all the kind of curves and the, um, and the gyruses of the previous diagram. <clears throat> now, that's a monkey. That's a monkey brain. Now this flat sheet is actually parcelated into like a, like a patchwork quilt. It's parcelated into roughly 50 areas that were named about 100 years ago. Um, there's a human brain with the same numbers parceled out. So every parcelation in a human brain, you get in a monkey brain as well, correspondence. Now, since 100 years ago, um, these 50 divisions have been further subdivided into 500 divisions. So imagine that your brain is like a patchwork quilt of these kind of separate functional areas, and it looks slightly different. And um, so you've got this flat sheet made up of these separate functional areas, and different areas will do different things. So that will deal with vision, all, that, all that's to deal with vision, that deals with touch, that deals with movement, and that deals with higher thoughts. And a remarkable thing is that this flat sheet is completely made up of what's called cortical columns, about 0.3 millimeters in diameter, a column. Each column contains about 1,000 neurons, roughly. The, the amazing thing is, uh, cortical columns are also found in a mouse brain. And in a mouse brain, they're also the same diameter, have roughly the same organization, same number of neurons. So you have this basic building block, which is found in mouse brains. And this building block's been preserved into human brains, multiplied many, many times. So a uh, mouse brain is a tiny sliver, but your human cortex is this huge kind of sheet, but it's actually made up of the same basic building block. That's amazing, isn't it? And it's the same build, building, building block as, as a mouse brain. <clears throat> so uh, th these cortical columns, this kind of building block of the brain, has a very stereotypical architecture, which is the same for a mouse brain. And it has, uh, uh, and say, this is, these are three views of a cortical column. It's basically divided into six layers, okay, six kind of stereotypical layers. Now, different parts of the brain will have variations uh, uh, in the layers. So that's um, motor cortex, which has slightly thicker cells in layer five, and primary visual cortex are slightly more granular cells in layer four. So regional variations, but it's taking, taking the same basic design. You're kind of tweaking it to make variations in different parts of the brain. And uh, these are some of the neurons in, in, in a column. So imagine um, the pyramidal cells, which is about 80% of all the neurons in the brain um, in a cortical column, uh, the main workhorse of the brain. Imagine, say, 800 of those and then 200 of these, these types. They kind of compress it into like a, like a, like a roll-up. And that's, that's a cortical column. Okay, and that's, uh, that's your basic architecture building block, block of the brain. And your cerebral cortex and white matter consists of about 80% of your entire brain mass. So that's where most of the action is going on. Now, um, the, uh, the, the, these patches are, 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 are special because they're topographic, which means they represent things topographically in pictorial form. So in this brain scan, that's the back of a, a human head looking at a picture projecting to the back of the visual cortex. Now, topographic means that the flat sheet of your brain, where it represents um, light, uh, points of light on your retina, then a, a, a point of light adjacent on your retina will, will be adjacent on the, on the, re on the uh, uh, primary visual cortex. So it's like if you, have, if you have a picture of light in your retina, that picture gets projected onto the back of your visual cortex. And the same with touch and the same with all other mod modalities. And um, this is a point where, where I kind of alienate um, probably most of, my, most of my audience here. But um, in one experiment, um, monkeys made to look at this thing and uh, radioactive traces put in and then monkeys sacrificed and that's basically the pattern in its visual cortex. Okay, moving quickly on. So kind of, kind of basically the picture <laughs> is a picture, okay, just, it's a picture in the retina which is projected to the visual cortex and it's very, very precise and topographic. And the same, 
Um, and the same for, uh, for hearing as well. You have, instead of topographic, you have tonotopic. So your ear does a kind of frequency analysis. Like in your hi-fi, you have frequency analysis, which means the sound is turned into something visual. So the bass notes to the left and the high notes to, to the right, and you play a song, and then the kind of graphic equalizer goes up and down. But your ear does that. So it kind of you, it makes a picture out of sound, and that picture is projected to your primary auditory cortex. And, um, <laughs> and, and so on. So, um, also with touch, smartest sensory cortex, um, a, a kind of on the side of your brain. Um, so if you imagine, um, you see that's the lip area, the face area, kind of the homunculus is drawn to correspond with the, the parts of touch in your smartest, smartest sensory cortex. And again, um, uh, touch topic, so touch two different points on your skin and two adjacent points on your, on your somatotopic cortex. Now you see here, that, where, where the toes are, adjacent is, is the genitals. And that's the reason why, if you suck people's toes, it's like, well, it's erogenous, you see. Or well, there's, there's the speaker um, putting in some gratuitous sex into his talk to try and perk up his audience. It's the old, old, oldest trick in the book, and it works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so um, yeah. So, so, so you get a picture, uh, topographic, somatotopic, turnotopic, retinotopic. Okay. Um, something I must have missed. In, in the visual cortex, um, you don't see bars of light. You, you, sorry, you don't see points of light. You, it, it separates the points into bars. So, so basically, you have bar detectors in your, in your uh, primary visual cortex. So you see a, a bar in a certain orientation, a certain part of your uh, visual cortex, then, then a certain column will light up. And then, now, now you see here, we have several columns in a kind of spin wheel formation and each column represents a kind of orientation at a slightly different orientation. So you see these different bars of light at slightly different orientations and it's color coded. So basically a hyper column is, is a collection of columns and between the hyper column a bar, of, a bar of light at any orientation is represented. So kind of columns are grouped together to make hyper columns. And the thing about these hyper columns, they, okay, this will come up later on, they, they compete against one another. So the winning column that sees a bar of light at a certain orientation will, will suppress its neighbors. Okay, we're going to come to, back to this because it's a fractal feature of the brain, this, this competition aspect, which is important. Now, these patches of cortex, these, these, uh, this patchwork quilt is connected in such a way in a hierarchy. So if um, back to where we were, the, that's all to do with vision. That's your primary visual cortex. Then all these patches to do with vision in the monkey brain, all parcelated, is arranged in a, in a hierarchy. Can you see? So that's basically where your eyes go in, primary visual cortex, and it kind of, through many processing stations, it ends up in a part of the brain called a hippocampus. Just as, as you have a visual hierarchy, you also have a hierarchy for touch, and it ends up in the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is this structure here, and all your sensory modalities converge to the hippocampus. Now if you lose your hippocampus, you can't form new memories. In fact, if you lose a tiny sliver of neurons in a tiny region of the hippocampus called a CA1, you can't form new memories. Meet, meet the person, same person again and again, never learn your way home, do the same crossword puzzle again and again. But it makes sense, doesn't it? If you, your sensory uh, kind of apex, all of your senses funnel into this hippocampus and you lose it, then you can't kind of bind those sensory elements together, which, which are what memories are made of. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So in the same way, we have a kind of hierarchy for the, uh, for, for the sensory side, and that's actually a diagram of the hippocampus, all the uh, inputs into the hippocampus. That's a su superior temporal gyrus to do with hearing, that's all to do with vision, that's to do with touch. And um, in the same way, we have a hierarchy for sensing, we also have a hierarchy for doing. So all the things we do start from the top of this hierarchy, but here it's called the cingulate cortex. So we start from the top of this hierarchy of doing, and it kind of, it kind of, they have kind of like a, another hierarchy, all, all the things we can do. So, I mean, um, if, say, um, visual spatial processing and memory access, if I asked you to visualize yourself walking down the street where you live, then you're doing something, aren't you? It's internal, but you're doing something. If I asked you what's your birthday, then you, you, you do something internally. And obviously, if I asked you to move your arms and leg, legs about, that's doing something. And also, if I asked you to think of something, uh, do some calculation, that's doing something. And, and that's the, the cognitive division. So you see, these are kind of all our kind of modes of, modes of doing, memory access, visual spatial processing, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's the kind of apex of your doing hierarchy. Um, th that's just another um, from experimental data, kind of um, from scans, uh, where people are made to think things. So that's the cognitive division. That's how, how, how they you know, learn about these things from brain scans, but also through anatomy. 
Now, um, some of these separate doing hierarchies are found in the front of your brain, where most of the sensory hierarchies are in the back part. Now, um, th this hierarchy here um, is, is to do with speech. So the lower down, that, that's the motor cortex that moves your mouth. Then higher up are the representations of speech sounds. Then higher up is the represent representation of, of, of uh, words, saying words. Then higher up, sentence, sentences and, and syntax. And higher up, meaning. So, and then um, the hierarchy here is to do with object recognition and processing and also visual spatial manipulation. So when we kind of, you know, kind of manipulate things in our minds, kind of move them about in our heads, kind of shuffle things around in our minds, that, that's the part of the brain we're using. Now, uh, uh, another very, very important hierarchy is, um, now, is to do with uh, people uh, and it's our social brain. Now, again, if, if I kind of slice your down, brain down the middle and look, on a sidewards bit, okay, that's the that's cingulate cortex, but here, in the medial prefrontal cortex, we have, in these um, brain scans, if you ask to think about social things, if you ask to think about people and your, yourself in relation to other people, then that's the part of the brain that lights up. Now, this is also the part of the brain called the default mode network. It means that in brain scanning experiments, if you don't do anything, you're not given spe a specific task, then you basically you go into a default mode which means essentially like you daydream. So, so it's official now. Neuroscience says you daydream. Mm -hmm. And what do you daydream about? You daydream about social things, don't you? You daydream about people and yourself in relation to it. You daydream about how can I become famous? How can I get promoted? How can I become loved? Is, does that ring true? How can I, you know, you think about social things. You think, and you plot and scheme. You think, um, you know, how can I get into that person's underwear? How can I, you know, uh, undermine my enemy? Because I don't think about those sorts of things. I'm just kind of speculating what other people might think about. But you, you know, you get the picture. You think social things. That's daydreaming, isn't it? It's basically the default mode network, and that's your social brain, your social hierarchy, in other words. So uh, all these uh, hierarchies of doing and all these hierarchies of sensing. This is a, a diagram of uh, kind of the cognitive hierarchy. Now, um, these two hierarchies on the, on the left side is, is your sensory hierarchy and that's your motor hierarchy. Now, they're, they're interconnected. So the back part of your brain to do with sensing and the front part to do with, with doing are interconnected. They're interconnected in such a way that the same levels of the hierarchy are interconnected with the corresponding level on the other side. So, so as you go up the hierarchy, the, 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 uh, the same levels tend to talk to one another, much like people, much like society. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, uh, it doesn't always have to be like that. But anyway, so you have this kind of like hierarchy and the, the two levels tend to talk to one another and, and the hierarchy e extends even up to the hippocampus and the kind of microstructures of the hippocampus. And it's, and it's very precise and it's very um, ordered. Now, um, a, a concept I want to introduce is top down and bottom up. Now, bottom up means that the sensory primitives or the motor primitives, i.e., you know, kind of automatic movements, that, that's the bottom, and you know, bar detectors and points of light, that's the bottom of your sensory hierarchy. Now, the, as you go bottom up, the representations become more and more abstract. So you bind together line detectors into you know, kind of features, into objects, into more complex objects. So as you go up the hierarchy, as you go bottom up, then it becomes more complex. Simple movements get chained together to make uh, more complex movements into whole behaviors, and the whole you know, kind of behavior expressed over many days or even over a lifetime. So that, that, that's the meaning of bottom up and top down. Now, the, um, the ways the, the uh, motor and sensor hierarchies interconnect with one another is very precise. Now, I talked about the six layers early on. Now, this is, this is a, a very um, interesting point from recent research, is that as we go bottom up in either the sensory hierarchy or the motor hierarchy, there's a very stereotypical pattern of project, projection. As we go bottom up, Inputs tend to go into layer four, go up to um, go into layer four, then go up to layers one and two, and then as, and then it projects from layer two to three back to layer four again, up and then down again. So, so that's the bottom-up projection of, pass, of uh, projecting between layers in the hierarchy. And as you go top down, it's the opposite. You have a, a complementary pattern. You have um, projections from layer five go to layer one, and then it trickles down to layer five again, and then it goes to layer one. Well, to cut a long story short, you have, it's very precisely wired. The, the, as you go up the hierarchy, it's very, the, the, where the layers project is very, very precisely ordered. Um, so th this is a wiring diagram from a monkey brain of, of actually specific fiber bundles projecting the back part and the front part. And, and these, these projections obey this, this hierarchy uh, 
pattern and also this laminar projection pattern. Now here's actually a brain scan of uh, actual fibre tracts in the human brain. So actual uh, fibre tracts, tracts um, linking up the, the back part and the front part. Now th this is a very recent um, brain scan from the, the, the kind of latest cutting edge scanner. It gets more high resolution you see as the computers and the powers of the scanners get more powerful. Now an amazing staggering result came out in just, I mean neuroscience is so cutting edge and it's new, it's all, the results are pouring in now. And um, it was published in Science Magazine, probably one of the most prestigious science magazines in the world in 30th of March this year. And what they found was that the wiring of the cerebral cortex, okay, this is a staggering result, fundamental result about the wiring of the cerebral cortex. Now, the fiber bundles connecting front and back, left and right, but also all different patches. Now, the wiring, okay, it, it's completely grid like. It's actually, actually brand, the, the, the fibers always intersect at right angles, which means it's like an American city, it's, it's gritty. So even though I have all these patchwork uh, quilt arrangement of all these centers and, and areas, how it's connected ultimately underneath, it's like, like American grid pattern. The, the, wi the wires go you know, longitudinally across, but they never go diagonal. It's like staggering, isn't it? And that's only just been discovered. Fundamental result about how the brain's wired. I'm gonna show you later on in the talk, um, the explanation for this uh, wiring pattern that comes out of the fractal brain theory. An auxiliary structure of the, of the brain called a, is called a striatum, and it's absolutely vital. Now, your, your frontal cortex, you're doing part of your brain, the, the prefrontal cortex, doesn't work unless it works for the striatum. So the striatum is this structure here in green, and it's, and it's basically essential for all, your, all the things you do. Everything you do, everything you think, needs the striatum to work. And the, um, the front part of your brain, all that prefrontal cortex, works in conjunction with the striatum. Now, in this patchwork quilt arrangement, I mean, imagine these are subdivided into 10 kind of subdivisions. Each of those subdivisions has its own little patch of striatum, and it, and it forms a loop of that little patch. So um, if that's a striatum, that's the cerebral cortex, and each of these patches has its own little loop to work with. So here is the actual striatum, putamen caudate nucleus. So you can match up the numbers, say 32 is there, and 32 is over, ugh, it's over here, see? 46, and you can match up all the numbers, it's over here somewhere, 46. And each, subdiv each subdivision, correspondingly, has its own little patch of, 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 of stratum to work with. It's fascinating, isn't it? Now, um, okay, that's a more complex diagram of the stratum. It, it, it's, it's more complexity, it's not just a simple loop, because it's a fundamental structure of your brain, and every thought, every action you do uses a stratum. Now, it's interesting to go into a little complexity. That there's actually three parallel paths, and, um, and, and one loops back. One's called the indirect, one's called the direct, one's called the hyperdirect. And without drowning in detail, what it means is that the stratum works in such a way, in the same way that when you hit a guitar note, you don't just hit the note, what you do is you have to damp the note first, so there's nothing playing before you hit the note, then you hit the note, and then you stop the note. So you do three things. So as an analogy, what these three parallel circuits is doing is basically it's kind of damping down, clamping all the activity, then it's firing the signal, and then it's shutting off again. And that's why we have very precise signals, very precise behaviors, and very precise uh, kind of control of our arms and legs. So that's quite, uh, more complexity um, uh, behind the striatum. Now, um, here we go back to our, uh, our, our kind of cortical hierarchy. Now here we have the kind of motor hierarchy, that's your primary motor cortex, that goes to your muscles and effectors, that's your secondary uh, kind of um, secondary motor area, that's the tertiary motor area, okay, in this diagram. Now here we have a, a, in a diagram, the kind of it, each patch has its own little stratal loop, can you see? And then in, in grey, we have that, that very precise um, pattern of wiring between the different layers. So it's kind of composite diagram. Now, each of these stratal areas works in conjunction with a chemical called dopamine. Each patch of stratum has its own little dopamine loop. And if the dopamine flows, then the stratum works and your thoughts flow. And if the dopamine doesn't flow, then your thoughts don't flow and you don't move. So Parkinson's disease, you lose all these neurons in an area called a substantia nigra pars compacta, and you can't move. There's a, the famous story of the frozen addicts who were using a synthetic heroin called MPTP, it had an amazing high, but the next day they woke up with complete Parkinson's disease, and it, yeah, ended up uh, basically frozen for the rest of their lives. 
Sad, isn't it? I mean, really, is, uh, but that's, that, that's what the MPTP destroyed, these dopamine neurons. And also, if you take stimulants, like amphetamine, basically what it does is it boosts the dopamine, and it, you, basically your, your wheels turn much faster. Stimulants. Does that ring true with your experience? Cocaine, Coca-Cola, sunshine, boosts dopamine. So, I mean, so it's very precise. It's like a machine. Dopamine flows, the wheels turn, your thoughts turn, your actions move, animates. Now, um, here's uh, higher up the hierarchy, uh, anterior cingulate cortex. Um, these are kind of areas to do with thinking, and that links up to the, uh, the motor hierarchy, but that's the kind of like cognitive areas of your brain. Also have, like in this, the other diagram, their own patch of striatum. And uh, you, you, because the, um, the, the thinking part links into the moving part, not always, <laughs> we, we sometimes think about moving and we sometimes move about thinking, but we can concatenate the two hierarchies into one great big hierarchy, can you see? So there's one hierarchy of thinking, linking up with the hierarchy of doing into your motor factors. Now, you have this kind of amazing um, dopamine cascade, but up here we have the most famous dopamine pathway. In fact, this dopamine pathway is so famous, it's been on the cover of Time magazine. Now, what's, he, what's he talking about? Because th this dopamine pathway is the pathway of addiction. It's called a mesolimbic dopamine uh, uh, system. And uh, so every single addictive drug, without exception, activates this pathway. Now, I'll linger on this point a little bit because people are very interested in addictive drugs, aren't they? Especially if you're addicted. <laughs> but it's fascinating. I mean, if you smoke a cigarette, then basically the, the nicotine activates the cells in the ventral tegmental area. That's the official name of this part of the striatum. And then, uh, and then so dopamine flows. Cocaine works by inhibiting reuptake of dopamine at, at the uh, presynapse. And amphetamine does what cocaine does, but also causes dopamine to leak out. So it has a, has a twinfold effect. And ecstasy, there's a, there's a serotonin path for going into the ventral tegmental area. Ecstasy causes serotonin to leak out, and then it causes a massive rush of dopamine into your brain. So all these, without exception, all these addictive drugs activate the dopamine path. Uh, alcohol is funny, because alcohol, alcohol is inhibitory. Uh, as a chemical, but what, what, what happens is that normally there's an inhibitory circuit which clamps down the VTA dopamine neurons, but then alcohol inhibits that inhibition. So, um, pathway of addiction of ventral tegmental area goes to the nucleus accumbens and trickle down, trickle down, like a cascade. What we have is kind of dopamine flows, the, these higher wheels turn, which then make the lower wheels turn, make the lower wheels turn, and it's kind of cascade of dopamine. Dopamine cascades down, cas cascades down, cascades down. So it's almost like a machine, isn't it? It's almost like a, like a real kind of like device that kind of the cog wheels turning above causes the cog wheels below to turn and your arms and legs move. Isn't that fascinating, isn't it? And uh, now the, the, the question is, the question is, if addictive drugs activate your um, mesolimbic dopamine system, then what naturally activates your pathway of addiction? So that's the question mark. Well, the answer is your emotion centers, surely. If addictive drugs normally um, you know, make you addicted and do things you wouldn't normally do, then, then basically your emotions are your n n natural drive, aren't they? So, so we're going to now talk about the emotion centers. This is, this is where it gets interesting, that, that drive all our behavior. Now, now the, the emotion centers are, are free tiered. And these three tiers reflect, one, evolution, you get evolutionarily old, but also as we go up complexity, um, we, we get more sophisticated emotions and, and fears and desires, and, um, and also more yeah, sophistication. So um, hypothalamus is something you learn about in school. It's the most um, important, one of the most important parts of your brain. Amygdala, you read about sometimes, but the ventral and medial prefrontal cortex is something that's less familiar. Now, 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 these things deal with fear and desire in the most, um, you know, everything you do, everything you do naturally is, is driven by these emotion centers. And it's interesting to go into this a little in depth. Now, the hypothalamus is that basically, it's, it's a tiny sliver of neurons in your brain. And it basically deals with things like hunger, thirst, and warmth, and, um, and, 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 and things like, you know, homeostasis in the most basic way. It deals with hunger by literally detecting glucose in your blood. So low glucose means you're hungry. It deals with first by actually detecting the osmotic balance between membranes, actually measures the amount of water in your blood, and it actually measures the temperature of your blood. So basically, these are your basic drives. If you don't satisfy these drives, then you die. So your hypothalamus is the kind of foundation of all your fears and desires. If you don't do what the hypothalamus says, you don't exist. <laughs> Now, um, the amygdala is slightly more complex, it's evolutionarily kind of more recent. That's the amygdala in front of your hippocampus. 
Now, it gets more complex because your amygdala deals things like what hypothalamus does deal with sexual drive and, uh, and, and orgasm, but the amygdala deals with things like sexual orientation and, and sexual preference and also gender orientation and also maternal behavior. And also in, in uh, mice and rats, all um, sexual behavior is driven by pheromones. It's all driven by smell. That's why, my, why rats and mice in pitch black can, can well, breed like mice and rats because they don't have to see. It's all driven by smell. So, um, as you go further up, it gets even more complex. Also, the amygdala deals with fear, maternal behavior, and also condition, conditioning as well. Um, learn, learned uh, associations, uh, condition, place, preference, contextual fear, fear, aversion, conditioning. If you lose your amygdala, then you lose your sense of fear. So amazing. But, you know, it sounds, sounds great until you realize that if you lose your sense of fear, then you know, you're going to start walking into cars and stuff. As we go further up the hierarchy, now amygdala to ventral and medial prefrontal cortex, it gets more sophisticated. Now, ventral and medial prefrontal cortex, or ventral or orbital frontal cortex, is kind of like looking underneath, above your eye sockets, and it's part of your brain looking beneath up. And uh, you split, split down, down the middle again, this kind of section here, especially around here, and this region here underneath your brain is heavily involved with emotional processing. Now, here, your, your desires and fears get more complex now because I mean, this is a monkey brain, and different areas deal with vision, touch, and taste. Now, um, the sensation of fat in your mouth, that kind of ice cream, you know, my daughter loves ice cream, it's hardwired. But buttered bread versus non-buttered bread, that kind of slippery sensation in your mouth, kind of oily, wet olive oil pizza, you're actually hardwired to gain pleasure from that. That's why little kids just love ice cream. And it makes sense, in ancient times, Fat was really, really a high reward thing. Now it's kind of something people obsess to get rid of. But in some cultures, I mean, the famous joke in Chinese culture is actually, you know, um, if you're fat, I mean, as these are changing, fat means good, okay? The classic um, gauchery of someone from mainland China. It doesn't have itself for now because it's more integrated now. I mean, you know, a man comes over to the West and in a party, dinner party, says to a woman, he's just been introduced to you, introduced to you, you're fat. <laughs> Meaning it's a compliment, you know, so, so fat is actually, uh, you're hardwired to like fat, and it makes sense, doesn't it? And also, um, uh, okay, I mean, moving on from fat, I mean, um, vision, um, monkeys are hardwired to appreciate ripe fruit as opposed to non-ripe fruit. And that's, you know, basically it's biologically advantageous to eat ripe fruit. And also things like touch, I mean, we're, this is where a higher pleasure of, you know, stroking rabbits or kind of or stroking fat. <laughs> Um, you know, these pleasures also are... <laughs> this guy's... I know what you're thinking, this guy's fat obsessed. <laughs> fat, 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 fat. It's, it's always, it's got fat in his mind. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, so fat and, uh, you know, stroking, and stroking, um, you know, soft things and these higher kind of sensations are kind of slightly above what the amygdala can handle and also what the hypothalamus can handle. Also, incidentally, the, the hypothalamus also can detect uh, fatty acids in your blood and uh, that's, that's rewarding. So um, now as we go further up, we, um, we have a kind of, s in a human brain, as you go, go further more to the tip of the brain, it's more complex than the monkey brain, in the orbital frontal cortex, the, um, the desires and the kind of like associations become more and more abstract. As we go from the back to the front, things like money, things like um, people, like you know, social assessments, I mean, say uh, sexual assessment, I mean, you have kind of, um, you know, orgasm, you have things like pheromone processing, but then you have even more advanced things like, uh, you know, uh, hard men are hardwired to appreciate the 0.7 ratio. That's, you know, exactly how it works. But for some reason, 0.7 hip ratio, you know, we're hardwired to like it. And also uh, soft, shiny skin means high estrogen and shiny hair. And it's something we're hardwired to detect. And, and also women, I mean, square shoulders and, and, and kind of a square jawline is basically something that's hardwired. It triggers certain, you know, feelings. So this is kind of more complex. And even more complex than that is, is uh, you know, kind of social things. Foucault, the philosopher, said that hell is other people, but so is heaven. So as we go further up, things like um, empathy and morality are processed by at, right at the tip of the brain. And also, things like, um, back, back to sex, I mean, status, I mean, something like status that the amygdala cannot handle. Because uh, this idea that women have to really assess men, because it takes a man uh, kind of, you know, five minutes to propagate his genes in the next, next round of, you know, of life. 
but a woman is, is, is lumbered for at least nine months and then for years, uh, as, uh, as you know, anyone with a family knows. So a, a man c c sees, you know, a high estrogen, curves, shiny skin, shiny hair, and, you know, bing, 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 you know, uh, go for it. Whereas a woman really has to assess, but that means wit, humor, status. What's this man, you know, she looks fit, but what, what's behind this man? And it has to make a really amazingly careful assessment of it. And uh, so this is uh, something that, that this part of the brain would deal with, status, something far beyond what the amygdala or hypothalamus can do. Now, as you get right to the tip of the brain, then we're dealing with moral things and kind of really the, the highest uh, kind of um, social things. Um, empathy, etc., altruism, guilt, uh, compassion. But also this part of the brain is very easily damaged in, uh, in car accidents because it's at the front of the brain. If you get a car accident, you kind of go forwards and your brain hits the bone above your, the orbits of your eyes. In one controversial study, they found that um, incarcerated psychopaths really did kill lots of people and did horrible things to them and stuff. They found, very controversial study, they found that, um, okay, some of the psychopaths were, come, came from really bad homes. Like, and uh, I, I mean, I know this is, uh, goes against some people's ideas of, oh, it's, you know, con conditioning, et cetera, and stuff. I mean, but, uh, but really, um, sometimes uh, if you're like Hitler and your father, you know, beat the shit out of you and beat you into a coma several times, then that might induce psychopathy. Yeah. So this kind of conditioning can produce bad homes, can produce bad behavior. I know, I know it doesn't sit well with some people, but I think these are facts of life. Well, all these psychopaths uh, came, who came from bad homes, you could kind of explain where the behavior came from. Had a, I mean, really bad, you know, like, like Fritzl, the, uh, the guy who locked his daughter up, you know, his mother had beaten up in a concentration camp and stuff, you know, really severe stuff. But there was a subset of these psychopaths who came from perfect upbringings, perfect homes, and they became psychopaths. But then they found, without exception, these perfect upbringing kids all had some kind of abnormality in their orbital frontal cortex. And it's actually traced back to some kind of car accident or some kind of fall or some kind of trauma to the front of the head. Now, very controversial uh, results, I know, very controversial, but it kind of fits in with our, with our picture of, of a kind of, kind of gradient of desire and fear right up to the highest desires to do with people and, and society and, and morality. Um, so, um, these are the engines of the mind, this is what drives us, and this is the substrate of the engines of the mind. Now, uh, now the interesting thing, the latest cutting-edge research has shown that these um, engines of the mind also have the same striatal structure as the rest of the prefrontal cortex. Now this is um, really was a controversial result for years and years and years, but it's only in, in recent maybe five, ten years that's been widely accepted now. You won't find this in neuroscience textbooks yet, but it is, it is basically an accepted result that each of these areas have their own little bit of striatum. That is actually um, the anterior cingulate cortex. The, the higher part is connected to the nucleus accumbens and the pathway of addiction. But then also the amygdala has its own little striatal area and its own little dopamine loop as well. And right to the top, the hypothalamus has its own bit of striatum, lateral septum, and its own dopamine system. Now, this is, this is um, interesting because we're going to do something innovative now. I'm going to justify this innovation, and I'm going to show you why it fits into the wider scheme I'm going to show. What it means is that we can fit... OK, this is the emotion centers we've been talking about, the, uh, the three-tiered emotion centers. Um, and we've basically... Um, kind of made it into the same format as the rest of the prefrontal cortex. What it means is that we now can now fit the emotion centers and the rest of the prefrontal cortex into one hierarchy. And I can justify it because I'm going to do something interesting later on with this hierarchy. We can justify it because the, the dopamine cascade pattern seems to fit with higher up the emotion centers, that indeed the emotion centers do kind of cascade the dopamine down and, and within itself. But also the pattern of projection into the cortical areas fits that top-down pattern of projecting. And also because each of these motion centers also has its own architecture of stratum and dopamine, then it makes perfect sense to fit um, it all into one hierarchy. And also uh, research shows that indeed emotions, there's not a cutoff between cognition, doing and emotions, it's actually one continuum. Now, I'm going to fractalize the brain in a minute. I'll show you exactly why <coughs> this, this, uh, this innovation is actually so, so interesting and important later on. And it's because of what we're going to do now. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to completely Russian doll fractalize the brain. Okay, so we're going to begin pre preliminaries. We're going to fractalize the entire brain. So back to our Russian dolls. Okay, so we, we think that this is how the brain is organized. Okay, so it's basically a, a, a Russian doll fractal nested structure. Now, the, um, the, we, we saw those pyramidal neurons earlier on in, in, a, in, a, in a cortical column, and it's about 800 of those in a single column. Now, there's a, there's a stereotypical sequence which we're going to show you, which is completely fractal. A, a pyramidal cell has dendrites feeding signals into it. So it's feeding into the cell body. And then an axon comes out from the cell body and it, it goes to other areas, other pyramidal cells, and it branches out, branches out, branches out. So there's a process of feeding in and feeding out. But also there's a looping back. The, the signal would always loop back to the same vicinity as the original cell. Now, if you take a cortical column, different columns will project into that cortical column. And then um, the cortical column, the entire collection of neurons will project out to other cortical columns. And then the entire cortical column will loop back into itself. If we take a, a, a macro column, a hyper column, and then again, same pattern of projecting out to neighboring hyper columns, feeding in from hy neighboring hyper columns, but also this kind of looping back. Now, if we take an entire sheet of cortex, we also have this kind of like flowing in from different patches of cortex, a flowing out to other patches of cortex, but also looping back either through um, the, the microscopic um, kind of looping back from, from columns, or else the looping back from its own stratal loop. So here we have, that, have the same cortical patch, which is prefrontal cortex, and we have a, the, the same loop, but then projecting out and projecting in from other cortical patches, which also have that same fractal structure, feeding in, feeding out, looping back. Now, okay, we go to an entire, we go to the entire brain now. Now we have this pattern where we have these kind of um, flowing in to the hippocampus of all these separate sensory modalities, and the sensory modalities combine to make composite sensory modalities. Whereas now, each branch is not a single sliver of dendrite or nerve fiber, it's actually an entire modality of doing. So basically, if that's the hippocampus, then these are all the major inputs to the hippocampus, then each of these blocks is like one of these major, major branches flowing into the hippocampus. And correspondingly, when we get to the cingulate cortex, each of these um, boxes, each of these branches, is, is, is not just a, a nerve fiber, it's actually an entire mode of doing. And each mode of doing will flow into sub-modes of doing in, in this kind of branching structure. And then also, the entire cingulate cortex, the entire brain, loops back on itself. So we see this wiring diagram of the um, hippocampal cortex, hippocampal um, complex. So this block here is basically cingulate cortex and retrosplenial cortex, which is basically that, retrosplenial cortex, and that's the rest of the cingulate cortex. So we see here, the looping back in this instance is not just a nerve fiber, but it's an entire thick bundle of hundreds of thousands of you know, axons. But the main point is that this flowing in, flowing out, looping back, is completely fractal. So each component here, each block also has the same structure of flowing into it, other blocks flow into it, flow out from it, and then loop back either through a stratal loop or not, through, through a more localized loop. Then each of these substructures has its own um, kind of flowing in, flowing out, made up of these hypercolumns with flowing out, flowing in, looping back, made of columns flowing out, flowing in, looping back, and to neurons flowing in, completely fractal. Now, to further fractalize the brain, I'll show you why I, I did my little innovation earlier on, because we, we're going to basically completely concatenate this hierarchy into a single Russian doll structure. And the reason why I can do that is, to, is, is okay, a diagram sometimes is worth a thousand words, and a single diagram will, will make my point. Now, even though this exists in a hierarchy, a kind of lateral hierarchy, is actually Russian doll structure. I'll tell you why, because a single diagram, you know that, um, it, on your computer, you make directories and you make subdirectories. You make folders and you put things into folders. Now, now these directories can be can be written in two ways. In old-fashioned MS-DOS or um, you know Unix, you had to type out a long list of names. So each one of those words is 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 a directory and that's a subdirectory. So my documents subdirectory my my music subdirectory of rock and pop Elvis songs. So you see a hierarchy of, of directory structure. But you also know that this directory structure also has a kind of folder structure. So especially in, in Apple Macs, uses kind of like you know, the folders also nested. What, what's represented as a, as a long list of names is also logically and virtually the same. You know, it's basically topo topologically the same as, as a folder structure. So now I apply this 
um, long list um, structure to my earlier concatenation of the um, emotion centers with the um, cognitive hierarchy, with the motor hierarchy, you can see the same concept applies in that the same hierarchy can also be conceptualized equivalent to nested folders. So, so you know, you know um, moving a muscle in my motor cortex mo that moves my mouth exists in the context of saying word sounds, exists in the context of saying words, exists in the context of saying s sentences, exists in the context of meaning, exists in the context of, of the, you know, what I want to do that meaning, what I want to convey, and the kind of final objective of what I'm trying to say. But you see, basically, nesting, nesting, nesting. So therefore, the entire brain, the lateral hierarchies, concatenate into Russian doll structure. So therefore, the entire brain, i.e. all the hierarchies, concatenate into one big Russian doll. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's a visual explanation of something very complex. Okay. What, what um, Michael Barnsley, the fractal mathematician, calls the mathematics of the eye. No, not only is, um, just quickly go over, not only is brain structure fractal, Russian doll-like, but also brain process is also completely fractal. So the process of the brain is also completely fractal. I t I'll tell you why. Neurotransmitters compete to bind onto receptors. And synapses compete on a stretch of dendrite to make links with a neuron. Neurons compete with one another for nerve growth factor. The ones that win the competition survive, and the ones that lose this competition, they die. As we saw earlier, cortical columns compete against one another to represent bars of light, different orientations. And then you know that your perceptions compete for interpretation. Is that, oh, is that a kind of cloud, or is it a kind of Jesus in the sky? <laughs> or, or, and you know that things compete for your attention. And you know that um, moods compete. Is a glass half full, is it half empty? And you know that when you make a decision, that's like a competition, isn't it? But surely that's completely fractal. And also, um, on a stretch of neuron, uh, synapses link up on a stretch of dendrite. They, they link up. And then dendrites link up in, in, in a cell body. And then neurons link up through synapses. And then uh, columns link up. And then patches of cortex link up in a hierarchy. But then you know you chain your thoughts together into you know, succession of thoughts and stuff. And thoughts link up. So completely fractal. So the process of the brain, fractal, but the structure of the brain, fractal. And another other thing we do, obviously, on a kind of whole human brain, whole human level, we sense things and we do things. So this uh, pattern we, we showed earlier of um, kind of uh, projecting in, projecting out, in a sense, is fractal doing and fractal sensing. So fractal sensing, fractal doing, fractal competing, fractal linking up. Not only is the structure of the brain fractal, but also the process, process of the brain is completely fractal as well. Now, we're going to take this theory much, much further. It goes, this is, these are preliminaries. This, you won't you believe how deep this theory goes. Seriously, you won't, you won't, I mean, this is, um, this is basically the, uh, the, the base of the mountain. We're going to go much, 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 much higher. You won't believe how far, how far this theory goes. Um, just, just to um, reinforce the point, I'll, I'll show an animation now. Now, now, now that, that is, um, that's called a diffusion limited aggregate. Can you see, it's actually a computer program. Now, can you see these little kind of specks? Okay, these are like little dots. They're moving, they're jiggling around random Brownian motion, jiggling about, okay. Now, now these used to be called slow grows. What's happening is that you have a central point, starts from the center, and it kind of zooms out, okay. Well, what's happening is these points are jiggling about, and when the point hits the, 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 this kind of branching tree, it kind of get, it sticks to it. Now, after it's stuck to it, it, it itself becomes sticky. So then when another point goes to it, it, it sticks to it as well. Now this is called diffusion limited aggregate. Uh, it used to be called a slow grow because you, you ran a computer overnight. For, and then basically you might get half that fractal. Okay. But now you run it for a few seconds and, and basically computers about you know, 10,000 times faster than they were in the 70s when these were discovered. Now what this is, um, diffusion limited aggregates, aggregates are used in complexity theory to model things like, um, like snowflake growth and town growth. So a, a snowflake always grows from an impurity. Um, if you don't have that impurity, then the snowflakes don't form. And also, when you freeze water, it starts from an impurity. You, you, you have this thing called supercooled water. If there's no impurities, you can have it minus 100 degrees, and the water doesn't freeze. It's supercooled. So snowflake formation and also freezing starts from an impurity. And it starts from that impurity. It grows outwards. The, the freezing spreads outwards. 
and towns. Um, it starts from some shack, a trader's shack in a, by a river. Then you know, some another settler moves and builds another shack next to it because people like to stay close and to uh, you know share share um, share things and stuff and to, to collaborate. And then eventually a whole town grows. And this is used to model town growth. Now um, it, it, we can also use this to model how we develop a higher order conditioning from primary um, kind of uh, unconditioned rewards. So back to the emotion centers again, you're, bo you're born with basic drives, you know nothing about the world, you have basic drives, the feeling of fat in your mouth, orgasm, you know, nice sense of touch. But you kind of backward chain complexity back from that. So as a baby, you, have not, you know very little of the world, but you kind of learn your mother's nipple, you learn a kind of sensation of food in your mouth, then you kind of learn through association that that food comes from a spoon, it comes from a little jar, it comes from a nipple, or it comes from the cupboard. And you chain these associations, and you go through life, and you basically chain from basic primary rewards a whole constellation of beliefs around your basic desires and your basic fears. So what I'm saying is, uh, diffusion limited aggregates are actually a model of how you form your knowledge webs. So each of these different colours might represent a basic drive. I mean. Um, so, I mean, blue might be sex, you know, because you think a lot about sex and how to get it. And, uh, or that might be football <laughs> in some people's brains, and that might be sex. I mean, you know. So each of these might represent a different drive, and you grow back from those basic drives uh, coded by your emotion centers, hypothalamus, amygdala, and uh, orbital frontal cortex, uh, 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 anterior cingular cortex. You basically, from that, you grow out this knowledge web that fits into your, into your kind of brain, your mind space. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is that, okay, everything I reason for this um, representation of my mind growing back from my emotion centers, this kind of a tree of knowledge growing in my mind space, representing my universe, my inner world of all, all, the things I, all the things I learn, all the things I like, all the things I fear, okay, is completely f is fractal with, um, with, a, um, with a neuron. So basically, these are neurons, okay? The thing is, everything I reason about a neuron, I can also reason about my diffusion limited aggregate representation of my brain. So in the same way, behaviors are, are reinforced by my emotion centers at the center where it begins. And you know, the orgasm sends a back spike of reward to reinforce all those behaviors that led to that orgasm. The needle in the arm, the kind of, <laughs> Cigarette ah, feels you know, reward, you know, feeling of you know, uh, satisfaction, Re chains rewards those behaviours that lead up to that satisfaction uh, in, in a complex way. In the same way, a neuron will fire, and then a, 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 a backspite is sent to all the, de the synapses which made it fire, and then literally. Over, over, over many days, literally proteins are shuttled from the cell body back to the synapses to actually consolidate them. So in the same way, everything I reason for this kind of um, structure of my structure of my knowledge web, I can also completely reason for my um, for for a neuron. So that's a fractal in a very abstract sense. But you can see the correspondence between something abstract, something existing in my mind space, and a neuron. So everything I reason for a neuron, I can also reason for my entire entire knowledge web, and that's another justification for why I I actually earlier on. And also, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of a, a, a allows a kind of a, um, explanation, also a reason why it makes perfect sense to put the emotion centers and the rest of your prefrontal cortex and the rest of your brain into one hierarchy. Okay. So um, th these are the kind of preliminaries. I mean, really, this is this the, the introduction. Uh, really, th th there's so much more. I'm going to take a short break brain theory into a, a proper scientific theory um, so we need to basically a language to capture our fractal decomposition of the brain in order to gain insight and understanding and, and, and uh, to, to also to um, uh, uh, program it into a computer as well. Now uh, the, the, the language and the formalism which we'll use to completely uh, represent this brain theory um, to, to mathematize it, no, no equations apart from, apart from a very simple one coming up, okay, is, is basically binary trees. Now binary trees are the most um, basic and important data structure in all computer science. So if these are trees, that's a binary tree, basically means all the branches are in two. 
So it doesn't branch in three, it always branches in two. So it's binary tree. And it's a fractal, you see. So, so each little binary branch is a fractal of the, of the main tree. In fact, most trees are fractal. Now, um, binary trees can be used to represent things. So say that's a binary tree, two branches, and you, you can imagine that as a square, two squares. And I can rotate it, and that's also a binary tree, and that's like a little two by two square. Now, I can, I can then, you can see that's also a binary tree, and I've got a kind of two, four by four grid, and that's also a big binary tree, and that's an even bigger binary tree. Now, each of these squares, I can either color black or, zip or white, zero or one. In the same way, when you take JPEGs with your, with your camera, basically, you're basically, you've got a grid and you're assigning a number. Well, you, you've got four numbers, well, well three numbers. You've got uh, red, green, blue, and you've got a number between one and, one and 256, and you, you assign a number to th those three numbers. And you, and you, with a big enough array, you get a photograph, basically. So the same principle, with, with, um, but, but just simpl simplified. Make it black and white, but you can easily add color. Okay, so okay, these are flat grids which can represent things, um, kind of pictures, if you like. Now, these spatial flat grids can also be um, can also represent time. So each each one of these flat grids has now been chained in time, and and, he, and, he, and this binary tree here is representing a sequence of flat grids. So, like a flick cartoon, each of these flat grids can contain a picture. And then over time, I can flick through the flick cartoon, and I can make a little animation or some you know, little cartoon animating in time. And that's how uh, movies work. That's how you know, computer movies work, kind of a succession of frames. So with binary trees, I can represent uh, space and time. Now, some of you might be thinking, binary trees, that's all very convenient for you. But what has that got to do with the brain? What's that got to do with psychology and the mind? Well, I'm going to show you in the next 10, 15 minutes absolutely everything. Okay, absolutely everything to do with how the brain works, uh, psychology and neuroscience. Right, and I'll show you why. There, there's a condition called hemineglect. We lose a part of your brain. You, you literally lose half your world. You, you lose one side of your, your, your visual, visual world. Now, this is a condition if you damage your right parietal cortex. If a man is asked to visualize the street where he grew up, to walk down it, and is asked to, to name the buildings to his left or right, he can only name the buildings on one side. But then he, he's told to walk to the end of the street and turn around and visualize where he grew up. Then, then, he, then he can name the, the, the buildings on the other side now. And if, he's, if this person's asked to draw, it's, quite, it's not uncommon. So there's many, many study, case studies in the world. Asked to draw a, a clock, he can only, she or he can only place them on one side of the, of the clock, or draw, draw a flower. And seeing a word, say, on a menu, you can only see one side of the word, can't actually read it. And this, this is funny, and, and, and this actually happens. A place of food, if the person's asked to eat a place of food, what happens is that, um, well, a place of food, a person starts eating, uh, and then he stops. And then if you turn the place of food around, he starts eating again, and then he stops. So it actually happens. So he's kind of lost half his world. Fascinating, isn't it? Binary subdivisioning of the world, and, he, and so on, etc. Also, uh, brain waves. Um, also are in powers of two. Now this is exactly the same diagram as before, but we're not talking about spatial frequency waves, we're talking about brain waves. Um, the famous um, alpha wave, 10 hertz. Um, also theta waves, 5 hertz. Beta waves, 10, 20, 40. Now when they gave these waves names, they weren't thinking in powers of two. This is just where the, the wave's energy is concentrated. This has happened to kind of, kind of be found at these frequencies, but we have this definite doubling pattern of five double to 10, double to 20, double to 40. And again, um, in music, that's how notes are kind of, you know, half and half to, to make notes. But what's interesting is how we, we use those notes, how we represent uh, music, um, pop music, folk music, nursery rhymes, but also all common, common time classical music has a certain meter, four beats to a measure. And then those four beats are grouped in eight. Then those eights are grouped in 16. Then those 16s are grouped in 32, and then 32 blocks will then be grouped in 64 powers of two. And if you don't group it in these kind of powers of two, it sounds peculiar, kind of, kind of suspended effect. So for some reason, powers of two, you know, kind of two, four, eight, 16, somehow it makes it easier for us to process music, common time classical music, folk music, pop music, nursery rhymes. There's something about powers of two in how we represent uh, mu musical beats and, uh, and uh, poetry and, and, and stuff but also language. Noam Chomsky 
decompose all languages in the world in a binary structure. So a very simple sentence, a noun phrase, word phrase, that's a binary tree. Brains think, simple sentence, a binary tree. Now, um, this, this more complex sentence, brains think binary. We have a, a binary branching here and another binary branching. Now, this simple binary tree can itself be contained in another bigger binary tree. Boy thinks brains think binary, and that's a binary tree. Now, all sentences can be decomposed in this way into binary structures, binary tree structures. Now, um, so, so we've covered vision, we've covered music and, and, and speech. Now, we can, we can generalize this to everything else. And, and the reason why is because in the first part of the talk, we've showed how the entire brain has, in the cortex has a common underlying architecture. And also because we are proposing that the brain is a fractal, self-similar, symmetrical structure, and we've gone a, a long way to show that, that that is the case, then we can extrapolate from speech, music, and vision to everything else. And it makes perfect sense, and we should do. Okay. Now, the real clincher, if you're not already um, convinced, is about how brains come into being. Because brains come into being in the same way all the cells in your body come into being, and that's through cell division, and that's also a binary branching process. So this is how you start life. You start, um, fertilized egg becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes 32, 64, doubling, 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 and eventually, after a few weeks, you become that. <laughs> so that's how you start off life. You become a flat disc. But that's a, that's, that's a Big step up from fertilized egg, okay, so you've gotten somewhere already. And then that, that flat disc, uh, a part of it will differentiate into the brain now. So that, that's how you start life. That, that's going to come, become the brain region. And um, so that brain region folds up into a tube. So, so that, that becomes your um, like kind of primitive brain. Now already, um, by four to six weeks, you've, your cells in this tube are already kind of uh, earmarked to become certain parts of your brain. Isn't that amazing? Four to five week embryo. Already kind of like the cells are dividing in such a way that um, there's always billions of cells already are going to become different parts of your brain. Now, this idea here is, is a flat map. What it means is that if the cells keep dividing, but they don't curl up and, and, and assume complex 3D structure. If the, if the cells stayed flat through the cell divisioning process, then they, then they make what's called a flat map, a cell flat map. So that's a flat, that's a, that's a hypothalamus from earlier on with complex 3D structure. And that's a flat map of the hypothalamus. It's basically flattened out. And that's a flat map of the cerebral cortex. Okay, so you, you see how cells divide in a binary way and we, we're representing that cell division in terms of flat maps. Now, there's a, there's a question of how do different regions of the brain and different regions of your body know what to be? There's such complexity, I mean, there's such a, a large number of areas here and a large number of areas of the cortex. They have to decide, know what to be, but also have to precisely know how to wire up with one another. So the regions have to be, you have to specify regions. But how do you specify the regions? Now, there's two ways. Uh, the, the, the two ways are extrinsic and intrinsic. A, a cell knows what to be, a neuron knows what to be, through to f in the same way that you, you become who you are, intrinsic and extrinsic, which means your genes, intrinsic from your lineage, and extrinsic from your conditioning, the people, your, your upbringing. In the same way, all the cells in your body know what to be through their lineage, where they came from, but also through their chemical environment. Now, it's very hard to... Um, basically um, specify the complexity of um, the brain in terms of chemical environment. Because then the question becomes, how do, you make, how do you create the boundaries to separate the chemical environments, to stop the chemicals from diffusing to other parts of the, of the brain? But there's a far easier way of specifying the regions, and that's through lineage. So basically, you specify these different re regions through lineage, through the cells, from where the cells come from. Now, uh, a computer, computer program which, which uh, illustrates this idea of lineage, uh, I'll show you. Um, ba basically, uh, a, a computer program I wrote, just close this one down and make it faster, this, um, this, this other program. Now, um, now, now can, you see, can you see that that is a binary tree? So if, if that's the central branch, if that central branch it divides into two, then recursively it divides into two again, and divides into two again. So, 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 so it's drawn in such a way that it's fractal and that, that fits, onto a, fits on flat onto the screen. But the, but the main thing is that is a binary tree. 
Now, um, how this program works is it it's basically, it, it marks out lineage. So basically, if I click on any node, any kind of node on this binary, binary tree, then every node below it gets marked slightly darker. So, so look, if, if I click on here, look, if I click on here, then everything below it has been marked slightly darker blue. And likewise, if I go down to one of its daughter nodes here and I, and I click it, it's marked darker blue again. I can randomly click and I can basically, tiny little node here, I can mark dark, darker blue, etc. Now this is the mother node, isn't it? This, this one here, can you see, at the center. If I, if I click on that, the entire, all the, its progeny, its daughter nodes, become marked in blue. So you see what's happening? I'm basically I'm using it to basically mark out different regions on this, on this binary grid through, that represents a binary tree. Now, um, so, so, you know, um, here's one I made earlier, echoing that famous Blue Peter line. Um, here's one I made earlier, look. That's the same diagram, but in uh, JPEG. So here's one I made earlier. Okay. So, so see, uh, the same principle I used to make, you know, I just showed you. I can, I can draw any arbitrary uh, picture by clicking on that screen, of that program. Now here's one, another one I made earlier but it, it's, it's symmetrical down the center. Okay, now to um, illustrate a point, now here is the flat map that I've drawn using my lineage program, and here's the flat map of the brain. What I'm saying is, in the same way, lineage can be used to mark out all these different brain regions in the hypothalamus, that's the flat map of the hypothalamus, and that's the flat map of the, hip, of the uh, cerebral cortex in all these different areas. I can use my lineage program to mark out corresponding areas in this flat map of the brain, in this digitized flat map of the brain. So what I'm saying is the same process of lineage that gives, that theoretically and most sensibly gives rise to real brains and real brain regions, I can also use that same process to, to create a digitized brain of corresponding brain regions and we're using the same lineage kind of um, process to do it. Now, now, because it's fractal, once I have this kind of way of doing things, then basically I can digitize the entire brain. I can basically create all the brain centers and all the subcenters of the brain in a fractal way. But once I have it in this kind of digital format, I can then, um, with, with binary trees, I can, I can digitize the entire brain. But also, um, once I have it in this kind of gritty format, I, I, can, I can also wire up different regions. And because the binary cell lineage gives me a way of specifying regions, it also gives me a code for giving these different regions addresses. So then I can make the wires go to different regions and address like sending letters. But the way it works is that there's, a, there's an addressing scheme which only allows the fibers to go up and across. That's super efficient because of binary coding. But this is exactly what they found in the recent paper. The fibers only go in this gritty, gritty pattern. That's exactly what I need for my brain theory to connect up my digitized brain. I'm saying if the, the digitized brain actually comes about for the same way that real brains come about, then this gritty wiring scheme is actually what they've found in real brains. Now, um, once I have it in this kind of gritty format, now suppose, um, okay, that's, that's the kind of my digitized brain, which you know, goes off to billions and billions of neurons. Now, um, with this binary language, if I want to link up two, this, this might correspond to my digitized brain. And uh, this is two major regions of the brain. Now, if I want to make connections to that region, then I, I can't go straight across. What I need to do is I need to do a tree walk. I need to go up, 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 down, 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 up. And, uh, and, and it's fractal. So, um, so basically, these are subregions of my digitized brain. If I want to go from there to there, I can't just go straight across. I need to go up, 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 up. You get the picture? Now, it sounds like absolute palaver. Why can't I just go across? But you realize that in the same way that you know, we, we have letters, we have basically uh, towns, we have, we have ca uh, countries, counties, streets. You, you get a picture, and then we have a, a door number. It would be a, a terrific hassle if there's basically one street and one, you know, or one number to represent every house in the world. So this hierarchical scheme is actually a really efficient way of addressing messages across our digitized brain and across, and across real brains as well. And okay, it's fractal, so it goes on and on to all the neurons in your brain. Now, um, this digitized scheme also allows me to digitize our topographic maps. So we have those tonotopic maps, uh, topographic maps, and somatotopic maps. Now, with this digitized scheme, I can also digitize all, all these uh, pictures that are projected in, into my cortex. And those pictures, those um, representations, those bars of light, 
at different orientations. I can also digitize as well. So it's basically a way of taking um, real, and you know, bars of light can represent like a simple picture, like basically just to, to show you a kind of principle. And these simple pictures can be animated in time. It's just where basically uh, uh, representing everything the brain can represent, but in a digitized way. But also the processes of the brain I talked about, um, linking up, competing, sensing and doing, I can also express those processes in my digital language. What we're heading towards now, really, is, is a way of uh, programming the brain theory into a computer. Now, now, I know some of you are going to be really in a state of shock, because it sounds really reductionist. And what about the soul? What about you know, the sacred and stuff? We're going to go, go, go to that at the, at the end. So, so, I mean, have no fears. We're going to basically restore the soul. So I'm not going to totally reduce you know, um, consciousness to nothing. I'm basically I'm going to go into the consciousness thing, consciousness thing in a minute, so don't go away. I mean, somebody will <laughs> walk out at this point. You know, oh God, damn reductionist! It's going <laughs> to reduce my brain to the computer. Okay, nothing, nothing, nothing of the sort. Okay, look. So, process of the brain, structure of the brain, completely digitized in, in this in this language. Now, um, we we need to represent time now. So, we have a static, digitized brain, but now we need to introduce time. We showed these brain waves earlier on, in the same way that the, the brain is digitized into a kind of um, digital quantized compartments. Time is also digitized. And we know this because of brain waves and because of the fact that, um, say, for instance, a theta wave in your hippocampus. Now, rabbits also have theta waves. And rabbits sniff. They actually sniff at five, six hertz a second. And the sniffing is actually in phase with the theta wave of their hippocampus. And um, basically, well, it basically uh, you know, coincides. Now, if you... Um, Put, if you put a signal at the trough of the theta wave of the rabbit, the smell signal, then the rabbit never learns the smell. It, it doesn't register it. And also gamma waves, how your, your visual cortex works. Now, now gamma waves are very special because your entire brain is, is predisposed to oscillate at 40 hertz. Your, your entire brain, all of it. And there's a reason for that, because the most common inhibitory receptor called the... <laughs> So it's like comical, gamma amino butyric acid A receptor subtype. So, there's one for hangman. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that's, that's 40 hertz and basically, well, basically this uh, receptor subtype um, has a kind of a resting period of 25 milliseconds. It does its thing, it inhibits. Okay, so, but then it has to rest for 25 milliseconds. They can inhibit again. Because there's 40, 25 milliseconds in a second, therefore, it works at 40 hertz. So your entire brain, kind of, kind of if given, um, uh, if it went synchronized, it will work at 40 hertz. And superimposed on 40 hertz component is your 20 hertz alpha wave and, uh, and theta wave component. Now, now, alpha waves, many people used to think that alpha waves were your resting state. Basically, when you relax, then basically alpha waves come out. We know now, research in the past 10 years, that alpha waves are used to synchronize the front and the back part of your brain. And then um, uh, the synchronization of more local areas is beta waves, and actual synchronization of even smaller areas is gamma waves. So it's a real kind of... Um, br br uh, and the main point is that basically time is, is discretized, it's sliced into intervals, in the same way that the structure is also kind of sliced up and quantized. Now, um, how do we represent time? Okay, so this, um, I've, I've shortened this explanation because it uh, uh, kind of got, got convoluted last time in the past talks. Basically, it's to do with those loops everywhere, in those loops we found all over the brain, the striatal loops, the looping that we found throughout the structure of the brain, looping back. Now, if this looping back is found all over the brain, it must be doing something fundamental. And I'm saying what the fundamental thing it's doing is representing time. And it's going to seem obvious once I explain it, because when we loop something back, if time is sliced in these kind of you know, packets, uh, quantized packets, now, at a certain time, if I represent something and I send a signal out, if I loop it back, by the time that thing gets back, it's, it's the next time interval. So therefore, when the next time interval t plus 1 happens, what I'm sensing is what happened in t minus 1. So basically, I'm actually being able to sample two points in time. So what I'm doing is basically I'm binary representing two points in time, neighboring points. But then I can take that same process recursively, then I can represent three points in time, basically adding to that binary tree. If I can recognize um, you know, two points in time, I can also reconstruct two points in time, and three points in time, and four points in time. To cut a long story short, what it means, these loops allow me to represent 
sequences, allow me to recognise sequences, but also allow me to reconstruct sequences. And that's what all behaviour is. And that's why these striatal loops are found throughout your prefrontal cortex. And we know that the striatum is to do sequencing thoughts and behaviours, and also rewarding those thoughts and behaviours with dopamine, and making them turn of dopamine. So um, there, there you have it, the representing of time, quantized time, in uh, gamma waves, beta waves, uh, alpha waves, and, and, and theta waves. And, and even lower waves, that are less than five, six hertz uh, delta waves, which could be a second, and even waves lower than that. We, we know your lives are sequenced in terms of hours and minutes, in terms of days, okay? not by brain waves, but, you know, fractal time, okay? A anyway, so what we've done is basically we've, uh, we've digitized the brain. So we've digitized the brain, we have this uh, explanation for this kind of um, gritty wiring scheme, which has just been latest research in neuroscience. We also have a way of introducing time, fractal time, to our digitized brain. So fractal time, fractal brain. With this language of digitized space and time, we can represent any thought, any action, any kind of thing we can represent in our real brains. We can also map to our digitized brain. Now, I know it's, we almost, this is almost sounding like artificial intelligence now. Now, I know this is a simplification of the brain theory, but the, the wider implementation of the brain theory and its implementation as artificial intelligence actually influence, influence those transforms I showed you earlier. So um, just find, uh, and just start another program. Now, th those transforms I showed earlier um, of a uh, slide, scale, rotate, you know, um, etc. Uh, um, basically, th those transformations are actually a part of the brain theory, but it's part of the brain theory in a fractal way. If I showed you this uh, diagram here, and I'll show you another computer animation, a uh, uh, picture's worth a thousand words, and an animation's worth tens of thousands of words. Uh, but can you see, like, if, that, if, that's a, if that's a fractal tree again, now, e each of these blue squares represents a, a kind of square representing that, that, that node. So that's your, that's your kind of master node, represents the entire subnodes. And as you go down, you have a kind of like a square within, within that square. And as you go down, you have squares within the square. Now, I, I imagine that I can shift, I can rotate, I can expand those squares, but it's fractal. So when I expand them, all the squares below also expand. But it's autonomous, because all the squares below can, have, or, can also autonomous, autonomously shift, rotate, and expand. Now, I know it's really hard to visualize, so I've wrote a computer program to visualize it for you. Um, shifting. So it's sliding about. So when the, when, the, when the big square slides and all the squares inside it slide with it, but all the squares within it can also slide on their own accord within it, and then all the sub-squares below slide, etc. So, so it's shifting, shimmering, but now all the squares can also fractally scale. So you can see, it's kind of expanding, contracting, and also squares can also um, rotate. What this is meant to show is that the brain theory and also the language to capture it is completely flexible, literally flexible. So you can represent things in a grid way, but the grids are completely flexible, you can basically, when you recognize things, you can recognize things distorted. You can actually, you know, even though we process grids and uh, digitize things, we can also distort those representations and we still recognize them. So what this, what, what this means is that we, we, we use these transformations to give the, uh, give the base theory a flexibility which comes very handy when we come to implementing artificial intelligence. So, so the theory and the representation is literally flexible. Some, some bright sparks will say, well, what about hexagonals? What about, you know, kind of um, place cells, uh, kind of hexagonal place cells in the hippocampus? What about those? Um, well, I mean, again, the mathematics of the eye, if, if that's a hexagonal grid, um, okay, I mean, as were pictures, pictures were a thousand words, basically hexagonal grid, square grid. So you, you can map, you know, other patterns onto, onto this gritty square language. Okay, we are basically crossing over now, you see, from neuroscience into artificial intelligence. So now we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. Now, um, so we're going to shift the gear now, just to make a brief detour in the world of artificial intelligence. Now, already we have a language, a unifying language, that unifies all brain structure, all brain process, fractal conception of the brain, and a formalism which is actually very succinct and actually describes all this brain structure in a very concise mathematical language. 
but also this language of binary trees is also the language of computer science, information theory and artificial intelligence. So we've basically bridged two separate worlds of brain science and artificial intelligence. So at the very least, this brain, brain theory provides a new language for basically bridging two massive areas of science and technology. Uh, so, so also the approach allows us to unify existing approaches in artificial intelligence because the main approach is, is neural nets or spatial temporal artificial intelligence. And because, as you saw earlier, we can represent neurons as nodes. I mean, we can link up, link up different nodes through tree walks. And also logical and symbolic AI is basically all binary trees. I mean, uh, lo uh, prologue, logic systems, um, language systems, uh, the way it's programmed artificial intelligence is through binary trees. And also what I call combinatorial AI, which is genetic algorithms. We're basically working directly in a language of combinatorial codes. So this conception allows us to basically unify these existing approaches in artificial, artificial intelligence in one succinct language. And, and uh, okay, this is slightly more recondite, but many of the most exciting Algorithms and AI and software technologies such as, okay, I mean, this is drowning in detail. In the future, there will be talks specifically about computer algorithms and AI. I'll just make the claim now that some of the hottest technologies in uh, computer science, uh, things like data compression, what makes your you know, MP3 music players and MPEG DVDs work, there's certain um, technologies and ideas behind it and also certain recurring ideas in artificial intelligence. Now, the brain theory actually captures all these best ideas, some of the best ideas in AI and computer science, but does it in a completely fractal way. So it's, it, it subsumes the existing technologies, but also fractalizes these technologies and gives it a kind of extra flexibility and power. Now, um, a, a common um, idea, which um, some of the biggest names in artificial intelligence, they all say this, uh, they say, there's going to be no unifying concept that intelligence is not a unitary thing. There's going to be no critical algorithm or no critical conceptual breakthrough that's going to give rise to artificial intelligence. They say basically intelligence is a multifaceted, disparate thing. There's no you know, one single unifying idea or overarching theory of artificial intelligence that's ever going to emerge. And these are some of the biggest names in artificial intelligence that said, said things along these lines. What the brain theory shows, okay, this, this, I'm going to show some stunning points is that uh, these, these ideas are mistaken, that the entire brain theory reduces to a single recursive atom. Not only is the brain theory fractal and completely all reducing of brain structure, but also the brain theory reduces to a recursive atom, that from this recursive atom and single recursive function, you can actually reconstruct the entire artificial intelligence and all, uh, your kind of virtual digitized brain. Now this sounds like an incredible claim until we realize that real brains emerge from a recursive atom called a fertilized egg. Now, okay, okay this is a bombshell, I'm going to drop a massive point. This is something behind the, the, the fractal brain theory, a huge um, idea behind the fractal brain theory, and it's in two parts. The brain theory reduces this, this brain theory and this fear of artificial intelligence reduces to a recursive self-modifying atom. But the brain theory also shows that the process by which brains come into being, the, bro the process by which brains work, is actually one and the same. It goes further, it goes further. It, it, the brain theory shows that the way brains work, the way brains come into being, i.e. neurogenesis and ontogenesis, the formation of our bodies, and also the process of evolution, is actually one process. There's a unifying symmetry and a unifying process which shows that all these seemingly three separate uh, areas of science is actually one unified thing. It's a huge claim, and I'll, I'll go um, to, to explain, go some lengths to explain why this is the case. It's an important point, because it's like an E equals MC squared of the brain theory. If E equals MC squared was the kind of unification of energy and matter, before, people thought that energy and matter were two separate things. But suddenly, E equals MC squared showed as a single equation which, which showed that they're interchangeable. Energy is matter, interchangeable matter with energy. Also, the theory of relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity, showed that um, space and time were actually one thing, space-time. And also showed that matter and energy and space-time were also one thing. That's a huge integration of many ideas that people think, thought were separate. What the brain theory shows is, is three areas which people think are separate. Evolution, evolution of species, cosmic evolution, 
the actual um, forms come into, into being, i.e. bodies, etc., and also the way the brain works, is actually one single theory. Massive claim, so I have to substantiate this claim, because it's huge. <laughs> so I have to go some ways to expl uh, you know, substantiate it, and it's huge, and it's, it's being... Um, need to get out there. Now, uh, it's going to get slightly technical, but it's going to be worth the effort. Now, no equations. Okay, again, this mathematics of the eye to, to, to um, explain this huge, dramatic, world-changing point. It's really going to change the world. Okay, <laughs> seriously. Um, okay, um, mathematics of the eye, no equations. I'm going to show why um, you can see this underlying symmetry between these, these three areas. Now, look, suppose... Um, to put it as absolute simplest, okay, this is, a, this is a binary tree that's supposed to represent cell division. So fertilized egg becomes two, becomes four. Now, the main point is that basically when we divide, each of those paths is basically a selection of combinatorial space. So basically, there's, there's, uh, there's four ways of selecting zero and one, two bits. So each of these boxes is basically a path of traversing down this binary tree. So if zero means I branch left and one means I branch right, zero, zero, which means I branch left, left to get there. And uh, one, zero means I had to branch right and then branch left to get there. And each of these boxes represents every single combination of branching I can possibly do. The main thing is that each of these boxes, each of these four virtual neurons, is a combinatorial code. Now, um, you, you take this process to infinity just to make it simple as possible, to, to make the point. Now, this diagram here is when I take those four virtual neurons that w represent a, a combinatorial code. Now, I link up these neurons laterally. So I've made four neurons, but now I link up the neurons laterally. So instead of going left and right, if I start from neuron one, I can say neuron one can either represent a zero or one. And as I go along, the second neuron can represent zero or one. As I, as I go along, the third neuron can represent zero or one. Now, the thing is, instead of left and right, we have zero or one. Well, the, the main point is, as I go one, two, three, four, see, one, two, three, four, this represents all the combinations of putting in zeros and one into these four virtual neurons. The main point is that as I link up across, I'm also creating all the combinatorial codes that these four neurons can represent. Now the next diagram is exactly equivalent to the last one. Because it was exactly equivalent, but instead of left and right, it's gone, it's gone past and future. But now this binary tree here is not representing four neurons that exist simultaneously. It's re representing one neuron, and it's transitioning through four states of time, through four brain waves. Now the same idea again, as I transition, I can, that, that one neuron can be zero or one, then in T plus one, the next time interval can be zero or one, etc. But in these four time steps, the main thing is that as I link up these, as I loop back rather, with the same neuron four times, then if that neuron can represent zero or one, again, I've created all the combinatorial codes, transitions, that that one neuron can go through. Can you see a symmetry between a kind of temporal looping, laterally connecting, and kind of flip that tree over that way, and neurogenesis. So with the mathematics of the eye, do you see a kind of pattern between creating combinatorial codes through cell division, creating combinatorial codes through laterally connecting up and, and connecting, um, uh, looping back um, a patch of neuron, or sorry, a patch of cortex or single neuron, I also create combinatorial codes. You see, there's an underlying symmetry between the way brains link up the ways brain animate in time, but also the ways that brains come into being. But evolution is also the exploration of combinatorial codes, but genetic codes. So there's an underlying uh, symmetry between how language that can capture the process of evolution and, um, and uh, the, the, the uh, process by which brains link up and animate in time, but also the, brains, the process by which brains come into being, but also all bodies come into being. Now, okay, it gets deeper, it gets, it gets even more cosmic, okay. This idea of uh, the uni unity between um, okay, E equals MC squared of the brain theory, unifying of, uh, huge unifying of ideas, okay, okay, this, that's what this explained. With this language, and this um, language that unifies uh, brain process, way brains come into being, way bodies come into being, and way bodies evolve, 
goes hand in hand with a, an idea that not only is the brain fractal and Russian doll nested, but the entire universe, okay, is also Russian doll and fractal. So now I have to quickly explain <laughs> how the universe is completely fractal and also corresponds how the brain theory extra completely <coughs> extrapolates into society and the entire universe and vice versa, the entire universe and society interpolates into the brain theory. Okay, this is going to be a st staggering result, which, which I believe is, is where science is heading anyway, which I'll show you in a minute. Now, now, we'll start from the very obvious, and then we'll go from the very obvious and undeniable to the more speculative. Now, it's undeniable that you start as a fertilized egg, you divide into two, four, eight, as we explained earlier. And then, um, as this process continues through, through bones, skin, sinews, and nerves, we become one entity. We become, surely, we become one body, one integrated whole. But along the way, before all these things connect up and divide and connect up, there's competition at every level. As the cells divide and differentiate and, and evolve within our bodies, they compete with one another. At, at all stages in, in our uh, formation of our bodies, there's a process of competition where things compete to, rep to um, do their job and the, and the best uh, cells uh, that survive and win a competition get the job. So there's a process of competition and linking up. And then uh, through this process, our bodies come to being. But a singularity into our, the, the, the things that become bodies and humans. Now, on a planetary scale, the human race started from probably a, a breeding pair or a very s small group of humans living somewhere in Africa. And compared to 7 billion people going on to 10 billion people, that's a singularity in, in Africa. Now, over thousands of years, these people spread out, spread out, spread out. They competed, obviously, sibling rivalry, intertribe rivalry, nature of rhythm, tooth and claw, you know, basically there's competition at all levels. There's war, there's basically um, competition between humans. But there's also linking up, there's also cooperation. Basically, humans form clans, form tribes, form kingdoms, form nation states, form trading blocks. And then we're heading into this kind of like global village. One of the issues of the age is this kind of global village become a, going to become a global tyranny or something more just. But surely, from a singularity, through this process of spreading out, spreading out, dividing competition, and linking up together through the jumbo jet internet, through mass communications, surely the world is becoming one place, one entity. Now, from the Big Bang singularity, again, a singularity of points, the universe expands, and then matter converges. And there's this idea in religion, but also in science and technology, that the entire universe becomes one entity, a cosmic Christ, a celestial Buddha, a universal Vishnu. This is not just religion. Um, Ray Kurzweil, the technologist, talks about the same idea, and also Frank Tipler, the physicist, the same idea that the entire universe becomes one entity. In the same way, the, um, the human race doesn't become one peaceful global village or one horrible world tyranny through one step. There's basically you know, intermediate steps of tribes, kingdoms, nation states. The universe doesn't become the cosmic Christ through one jump. It, there's basically planetary consciousnesses, <laughs> interstellar consciousnesses, galactic consciousnesses, intergalactic consciousnesses to the you know, absolute cosmic consciousness. Now, you see, what we have here is Russian dolls that within the cosmic kind of a uh, whole is uh, kind of intermediate consciousnesses to the unified uh, planetary consciousness to life forms, human beings. The idea is basically that the universe is a Russian doll that actually reflects the processes of the brain and vice versa, and the brain reflects the processes of society in the universe, but also that the Russian doll of the universe also contains all the Russian dolls of our minds. So there's one all-encompassing cosmic Russian doll of all life and all consciousness. And this is a very ancient idea of the cosmic tree, this all-encompassing kind of unified structure of all existence. And this is the idea that corresponds with this equal, equals empty squared of the brain theory. And what, we give, uh, what the theory gives is a kind of language to basically uh, support this ancient idea. Now, um, What's of interest is basically what I call the, the, the new physics or the latest science is really converging with this idea. And I'll tell you why, because, okay, a fractal universe, this is the paradigm of the age. Fractals everywhere. Fractal forms are the norm in the universe. And, and complexity theory, this idea, a, a study of complex things, life, um, societies, etc., in science and the quest for a unified theory of complexity. And also the idea of evolution as a master theory, this idea that... Um, Evolution is the master. If some people even say that evolution is before the laws of logic, the laws of logic evolve. 
audibly that, I mean, uh, some people believe that the laws of physics come out from the laws of evolution, and also that universes compete. So evolution as this master theory, it's almost as if, you know, if you evolutionists have rejected God, they've made evolution God. <laughs> it's kind of idolatry, isn't it? I mean, basically, uh, well, anyway, evolution as this master theory, but also the idea that evolution is going on in our brains. It's actually an idea in science right now, MEMS, neural Darwinism, genetic algorithms. Now, a huge paradigm, which is really, um, you know, taking the science world by storm is the information and com informational computa computational universe. And recent research has basically quantized space and time in the same way that energy is quantized, quantum mechanics. What I'd say is all these uh, cutting edge ideas in science, the new physics, is really convergent with the brain theory. Because if the brain describes this kind of cosmic information, this cosmic process, then really it is the complexity theory, this quest for a unified theory is the, the brain theory extrapolated to the universe. And if scientists see the entire universe as information and computation, what scientists are waiting to be told and explain to them is that this information of the universe is structured as knowledge. And evolution is an incomplete theory. If you extrapolate the brain theory, the brain is purposeful and meaningful. Things in our minds are meaningful and purposeful. So if you extrapolate the brain theory into the universe, then what you restore to science and cosmology is teleology, purpose and meaning. So it's a very kind of um, way of kind of um, bringing back old ideas into the mainstream. What I'd say is all these ideas are really converging towards the formalism in which the brain theory is expressed and the metaphysics and cosmology, which also goes with the brain theory. So I, I believe that the brain theory does have something to say about the universe. And this, even Roger Penrose suspects that something from biology will actually elucidate mysteries of the cosmos. And uh, I need to get in the position to show you know, scientists th that, that this is it. Huge claim. <laughs> Okay, it's going to get even, even huger. <laughs> okay, it's about to get even more dramatic now. Okay, you're going to shift into a whole other gear. Okay, it's going to get really far out now. It's going to get really far out. Okay, so I'll save the energy for this last bit. It's, this is the, um, the finale. Okay, this is the ultimate truth. This is what people had to join secret societies for years and years for, and to learn, and at the end of it, they didn't even necessarily get to learn it. You know? So this is the biggest mystery in, 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 in uh, all of science and philosophy and also the biggest secret in all, all, all history. And uh, basically, um, it, it's consciousness. Okay, it's consciousness. Is, is, is you in this room right now, the mystery of consciousness. And we're, we're going to explain it now. Okay, we'll explain mystery of consciousness. Okay, so it's a good value to talk, isn't it? <laughs> now, okay, this is the, uh, this is the, the, it gets really far out. Okay, look. Scientists, really, scientists and philosophers really have trouble um, answering the mystery of consciousness because what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce consciousness to the brain and they're getting nowhere. Um, basically, the working assumption is materialism. You know, how does the brain give rise to consciousness? And the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to show you exactly why now. I'm gonna, uh, I've got a way of showing even scientists uh, why uh, you know, consciousness doesn't reduce to the brain, the brain. It's the other way around, that a universe and all existence reduces the consciousness and it reduces the one consciousness. The astonishing hypothesis that the mystery of consciousness and the mystery of God are one and the same. Now, this might seem obvious because surely the properties of God, the Christ within, the Krishna within, the Allah close to you, the juggler vein, the Buddha within, seek holy text Adi Granth, the one God is all pervading and alone dwells in the mind. So God is imminent, but yet God is transcendent, transcends physical matter in this universe, but untouched by the universe, untouched by all the goings on in the universe. Exactly the properties of consciousness. There's nothing more imminent, imminent to you than your consciousness, close to you than your juggle of vein. But also consciousness is transcendent. They can't reduce consciousness to physical matter. So um, the idea that there's one consciousness and that you are it, that God is one, the greatest commandment in Judaism, hear O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The greatest commandment in Christianity, because Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, hear O Israel, the Lord your God, is, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Back of the guitar, the super soul, God inside you, quote, appears divided, but is never divided, and is always situated as one. And the idea that God is one, but also we are one, that um, in Christ there's no Jew, there's no Greek, and there is no slave, for in Christ we're all one. Uh, that Allah has created you from one soul, that your creation and your resurrection is but that of a single soul, not otherwise, that somehow we are all one person. Even in a John Lennon lyric, I am he as you are he and you are me and we're all together. Okay, the guy's off his head, obviously, but I mean, he saw the truth. 
<laughs> described as a modern Gnostic. Okay, drank the Kaikion and saw interesting things and wrote interesting lyrics. Good songs. And then, um, not so good songs. You had to recover. <laughs> From all the uh, uh, good, good song writing inspired by what we took. Um, and anyway, um, so, so God is one, we are one, the oneness of God and the oneness that we are is one and the same. So it's actually telling you that you're God, if you didn't know already. So that's the... Uh, now, now I'm going to explain how it is everyone's God now. Because <laughs> it's not just saying it, you need to explain it now. Um, I, need to, I need to qualify, because some people here are going to say, but hey, I didn't learn this in RE, what are you talking about? Is everyone is God thing. I, you know, RE, didn't, RE teacher didn't teach me. There's, there's nothing about this in religion, surely. Um, so I need to explain that there's two kinds of religion. There's, there's what's called exoteric religion, what we normally understand as religion. This is what we see, churches, synagogues, um, mosques, etc. Bible, Bhagavad Gita, Quran. <coughs> this is the aspect of religion where there is division and also the aspect of religion which will never reconcile with science. And also in ex the exoteric uh, mysteries, exoteric religion also includes those many faceted aspects of religion that people dismiss and think that's all religion's about. So religion, and all these aspects are true, but they're parts of the puzzle that, that indeed religion can be opium to the people, can be a way of controlling people and way of uh, a means of social cohesion. Uh, and it also religion contains in narrative form astrological and astronomical phenomena. And then people say, oh, but that's all it is. That these are aspects and are not mutually exclusive. So religion is multifaceted and it's all these things. But it's also something that's completely been missed by most people, most uh, the, 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 the um, Hawkings of this world, the Dawkings, the John Grays of this world, the militant atheists, is an aspect called the esoteric side of religion. And it's basically the esoteric side is alluded to in all religions, the hidden teachings of Moses, the um, hidden te teachings of Buddha, um, Jesus in the Bible, um, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven have been spoken in parables to everyone else the, the, it's, uh, it's a mystery, so the ever seeing, never perceiving, ever hearing, never understanding, an allusion to hidden mysteries. But when we go into these hidden mysteries, we see the truth spoken directly in the Sufi traditions, a favorite Sufi saying of, of Muhammad, man is my mystery and I'm his mystery, for I'm he himself and he is I myself. In the Gnostic Gospels of Thomas, Jesus says, drink from my mouth and you shall be as I and I shall be as you and the hidden things to you shall be revealed. So in the hidden mysteries of religion, we have this idea that, yes, we have these prophets that claim to be God, but they're saying that everyone is God. And the reason why we have esoteric mysteries is because they're hidden, because one, in the past, if you said these mysteries, you were killed. <laughs> so there's massive incentive not to say them. And also, for, for years, for all, for all history, these mysteries could not be explained. That's changed. We can now explain fully in a way that scientists and philosophers can understand how it is everyone's God now. And uh, two things have happened to make this uh, possible. One is uh, a thing called the, the Mandelbrot set. Now, th the one thing about materialism is that we have to account for the physical world. Isn't, okay, the, all the kind of traditions say that materialism is flawed. Philosophers Descartes, Kant, Berkeley, they all say, we can never know the physical world, we can only know our consciousness, therefore we can only assume that the physical world exists, we can never know it. And also um, in religion, Maya, Sanyata, that somehow it's illusory, you know, Plato's cave. Um, but we have to explain what's behind the illusion, we have to explain, account for the physical world. Now, um, this has been very hard, it's been kind of the stumbling block of, of idealism, the alternative to materialism, how do you account for the physical world? Now, a discovery in 75, the Mandelbrot set, really gives us an insight into the nature of the physical world. And it's actually the, the res recovery of a very ancient idea. Now, this, this the Mandelbrot set, is, is basically a kind of very famous fractal. Now, if I told you, uh, this is the, the, the overall Mandelbrot set, it's a mathematical object. Now, this mathematical object is infinitely complex, and it contains an infinity of information and detail. That's staggering. I mean, basically, that's the entire set. What I can do is I can zoom in on bits. Say, say the little box that I zoom in on it, see? And then I zoom in on that. That little box that I zoom in on it. I can, I can do it to infinity. So I can keep doing it. Little, little up there, look, I can zoom in on it, etc., etc., etc. Now, what if I told you that that entire Mandelbrot set, no smoke, no mirrors, nothing random going on, that entire infinity of information and detail is contained in a single equation. 
Now, it took Mandelbrot in the mid-70s to discover it because you need to an animate that equation thousands of times, thousands of times to render one pixel of the picture of the Mandelbrot set. So you couldn't do it by hand. You needed powerful computers to do it. And Mandelbrot happened to work for IBM, so he had access to powerful computers. Now, did he discover this or did he invent it? Surely Mandelbrot didn't invent all this pattern. He couldn't have, could he? This infinity of beauty. So he must have discovered it. But if, if he discovered the Mandelbrot set, where did the Mandelbrot set exist before he discovered it? Now, the answer is it exists platonically or mathematically. There's a mathematical realm of existence where these objects exist. And the universe could end and re-begin re again, but the Mandelbrot set will exist in this kind of transcendent mathematical realm. It always exists. Now, there's a very simple idea that uh, there is this idea of mathematical existence, but the idea that basically there's a close relationship between the universe and mathematics, a very ancient idea. Uh, Pythagoras, the ancient mystical sage, said that the universe is a number. Galileo, the book of nature, is written in the language of mathematics. Isaac Newton, God is a mathematician. Um, this occurring idea that somehow there's a close relationship between mathematics and the physical universe. Uh, Eugene Wigner, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in describing the physical world. Now, the proposition is, is that the nature of physical existence is mathematical. The reason why there's such a close relationship between mathematics and the physical universe, and also between, um, you know, um, kind of science and, and mathematics in the universe, is because the nature of physical existence and also the is also the same as the nature of mathematical existence. And that's, that's, um, that's a very ancient idea because it's the idea that the entire physical universe and all physical universes are contained in this equation of all existence, of all possible universes. And it's a very ancient idea. Now, some physicists even speculate that this equation exists. Paul Davis, in The Mind of God, talks about an equation that contains not just all the different eventual equations of laws of motion, etc., but also contains all the initial conditions from which you can calculate the universe from beginning to end. But also, Pythagoras, we talked about earlier, who brought the mysteries from Egypt to Greece. He, um, the universe is a number. Now, Plato, Platonic existence, Plato is described as a Pythagorean. And then... Plato's ideas were developed by the Neoplatonists. So lineage of ideas, Pythagoras, Plato, Neoplatonists, and Neoplatonist idea of the Logos found its way into the Bible. It's translated as the word, and you often hear it in the Queen's speech in the beginning, the first um, lines of St. John Gospel, uh, Freemason favorite, apparently. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word is God. The word was with God in the beginning. Through the, words, all through the word, all things were made. Without the word, nothing was made that has been made. But we understand the word logos comes from a lineage of ideas from the Platonist, Neoplatonist, back to Pythagoras, then it's the same idea of this mathematical equation that contains all existence. What I'm saying is, is that basically with this logos, we render in the same way we render animations, fly-throughs, the Mandelbrot set, we render subjective experience. That's me in this room looking at you now. That's you looking at me now. That's subjective experience. We render subjectivity, not physical reality. That physical reality is illusory. Now, in this diagram by Roger Penrose, he, he basically talks about three realms. Now, he does, believe, he does believe in the Platonic realm. Now, he talks about three realms. He talks about the physical world. He talks about a subjective mental world, and he talks about the Platonic mathematical world. What I'm simply saying is basically the physical world doesn't exist. That all we have is really the Logos and the one consciousness creating subjective experiences with the Logos. Now, um, this is a, this is a very um, <laughs> shocking view of, of uh, existence. It's a view of um, what physicists call block universe, it means the, the universe from beginning to end, space-time, the entire universe from beginning to end uh, as, as one object. Now, each of these dots would be all the consciousnesses in the entire universe from beginning to end. And the, the big dot at the end is the cosmic consciousness, celestial Buddha, uh, universal Vishnu. And every do one dot for every single life form that's ever existed from beginning of the universe to the end of the universe. Now, that's uh, the uh, materialist view of the universe from beginning to end. But there's another view. And it's the idea that you take all the beads representing every single consciousness in the universe from beginning to end, and you string them out in a single chain of transmigration, such that, basically, the universe is made up of a single uh, consciousness traversing eternity and experiencing all things, all the things that these individual consciousnesses see 
one lifetime, one experience at a time. Now, now su such that at every point on the string, all these consciousnesses, all these life forms can experience themselves as being one of the universe and becoming one with God, then it's not illusory, it's actually experience things as they really are. And fractal universe, fractal time, I can take any one of these beads and I can expand it out into a birth and a death of a life form and each of uh, these beads are themselves beads strung out, the days of a life strung out. So in the same way, fractal time, in the same way we as human beings sleep and awake to a new day, so it is that as God we die and awaken to a new life. And that's called reincarnation. And another common um, idea behind all the mystery traditions is reincarnation. So, um, so uh, reincarnation in, uh, in Judaism, in Kabbalah, in Gnosticism, and in the Sufi traditions is, is another unifying idea. So reincarnation and the idea that one undivided, indivisible soul goes hand in hand. Now, now I, I realize I've, I've made a really eccentric and extreme, uh, made a uh, kind of presented extreme idea. And it's so out there, it's, 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 it's almost like uh, most people would say it's insane. But I'm not trying to start a cult. I'm basically trying to um, really start like a, like a revolution in mental conceptions. But what this explanation does, it opens the way for other forms of spirituality and mysticism because you can water down the explanation to seek your tastes. So even though I believe it, I believe in absolute monism, Advaita Vedanta, that everyone is God, you can take that same explanation, but you can actually modify it to your own tastes. But what it does do is it modifies, it, sorry, it kind of uh, makes um, possible a kind of a resurgence of ancient mystical ideas that's completely reasonable. That's more reasonable than scientific worldview that exists today. So that's a huge thing to, and it's very hard to challenge as well. So basically we are talking about uh, a complete uh, revolution in, in mental conceptions and philosophy and science. Now, just, just to, to, to finish off, um, what we're talking about is basically a complete return of ancient mystery religion. That in this, once you understand that mystery of consciousness and mystery of God are one and the same, and that the brain theory extrapolates to the universe and it's, it's all one consciousness, what I'm claiming is that all the aspects of the brain theory in this table corresponds, extrapolates into all the things in the universe, but then also it brings back all these ancient mystical ideas once you understand it's one consciousness and they're basically they've been talking about these aspects of God all along. I'm saying there's total, total correspondence with the brain theory, with the universe, as science understands it, and also with all these ancient mystery traditions and all these ancient mystical ideas. Now that's for another talk for another day. Now, okay, just, just to end. It's a stunning thing, but basically it's come full circle. Do, do you know, do, it's a funny thing, because science and philosophy came from the mystical and the sacred and the religious. You, you kind of, the people who started science, uh, Einstein, Religion without science is blind. Science without religion is lame. Einstein also said, the sense of the mystical, the true source of all science. Isaac Newton wrote more about Kabbalah, alchemy, and prophecies than he did about science. He's been called the first scientist, but also the last magus. And also Pythagoras, who coined the word philosophy. In a sense, philosophy began with Pythagoras, but Pythagoras was uber-mystic, worship as a living god in his own lifetime. Uh, really, the, the luminary of the Greek mysteries. And also, I can go on and on, Leibniz. I mean, all these kind of like people who really created philosophy were themselves mystics and people heavily into the mystery tra traditions. And also, the invisible college, which gave rise to the Royal Society, which has been called the midwife of modern science. No institution uh, based in London uh, has done more to promote the modern scientific method than the invisible college. And the invisible college was a Freemason meeting group led by Christopher Wren. And Freemasonry really is esoteric religion in symbolized form. And the ideas get through. So basically, we've come full circle in that science and philosophy came from the mystical and the transcendent, has basically paved the way for this kind of fractal brain theory to emerge, to bring about a complete return of the mystery and the sacred esoteric traditions. So science, far from being the enemy of religion, was all along its friend and helper, helping to dispel nonsense religion, super, the religion of superstition and you know, false rituals, regulations, to pave the way for the return of the true religion. Isn't that a stunning ending? 
for the end of the age, this 26,000 year cycle. So basically, we, we, we rectify what's wrong with science. It's purposelessness, it's meaninglessness. We bring back the um, kind of like cooperation back to evolution. So selfish genes, Darwinism. We reaffirm synergy, cooperation, and uh, symbiosis. And also we fix what's wrong with philosophy. We revitalize a, a field that's lost its way. We basically wrap up philosophy because all philosophy reduces to two questions. And they are epistemology and ontology. Epistemology is the question, how do we know what we know? And uh, basically all philosophical questions can be reduced to that. Why does the philosopher think he or she knows that? But that's not the last question because we're still left to ask what's the nature of that which is asking the questions, nature of existence, ontology. So, okay, a, a theory of the brain really is the final word. A okay, definitive theory of the brain is the final word on the question of epistemology. But what we've shown is basically definitive answer to the ontological question on the side of idealism. So, uh, so we basically, in a sense, we lay foundations for philosophy for the 21st century. And, and, we, and we bring about the complete return of, of uh, the ancient mystery religions. So science, religion, and philosophy, um, uh, basically the intersection is, is found at mind-brain consciousness. And what the fractal brain theory will bring about is a complete return and a full circle, uh, a complete unification of science, religion, and philosophy. So it will be shown that the God in the gaps that science has not yet explained, mind-brain consciousness, is really where the true God was waiting to be discovered and revealed all along. And also, it will be shown that the nearest of the new, the most modern of the most modern, the cutting edge of science in the form of a final brain theory and the absolute bleeding edge of high technology in the form of artificial intelligence and the advent of the technological singularity is also the return of the oldest of the old, the most ancient of the most ancient, the uh, perennial, eternal, indeed sacred and transcendent. That, um, you, you know, the, the end of this 26,000 year cycle, how did the 2012 awakening happen? Maybe it happened because it was found, a way was found to explain to people why they were asleep in the first place. And also um, this idea that uh, this, uh, these ideas can really kind of start a revolution in mental conception. To conclude, uh, 2012, fractal brain theory, um, a kind of revelation of mind, brain consciousness coming soon to a planet near you, coming this year, 2012, end of the age, latter days of latter age. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>